From the seventh pan book of horror stories, selected by Herbert Van Thal. Never Talk to Strangers, by Alex White. Lottie Blake was travelling by train from Birmingham to London, and she was extremely nervous. She was a big, heavy girl with dark hair, flashing eyes, and apple-red cheeks. She'd never left Henley and Arden before, and as well as being nervous, she was very excited at the prospect of finding work in a large city. She loved the countryside, but had the feeling that in London, instead of existing, she would really be living. That among the bright lights, the gaiety and the sophistication, she might find romance, and perhaps even fame. She was a romantic girl. Stella Smith, who had been to school with her, was already in London, working in Paddington. She had been a little vague as to what her job actually was, some sort of job in a hotel, she'd said, a receptionist as far as Lottie could gather, but she was excellently paid and she had suggested that Lottie should join her. Lottie's parents had been against it at first, but the law of the money, £20 a week as a start, was too much for them all, so here she was, on her way. One thing, however, was marring her excitement. During the past two years, there'd been a series of murders in the district where she would be living, and the victims were always young girls of between 16 and 20 and Lottie was 17. The murderer not only killed the girls, but he dismembered the bodies so that the police had to find the pieces. An arm here, a torso there, and a head, perhaps in a hat box like that play Lottie had done at school by Emlyn Williams. What was it called? Oh yes, Night Must Fall. Horrible. Stella, however, had made nonsense of Lottie's fears. You'll be perfectly safe with me, she'd said. If you keep yourself to yourself and don't talk to strangers... You can share my digs which are smashing and I'll look after you until you're on your feet. She'd promised to meet Lottie at Paddington Station. The great thing is, she'd written once again, never get talking to strange men and then you'll be all right. And Lottie promised her parents that she'd heed the advice. She was travelling third class and the carriage was crowded. There were six men and one other woman. Luckily the woman who was middle-aged and motherly was sitting next to her and they struck up a conversation and Lottie was able to ignore all the men. So at least she knew she was safe until she saw Stella. We'll be there in a jiffy, said the motherly woman suddenly. Will you be all right on your own, dear? Yes, thank you, replied Lottie politely. My friend Stella Smith will be meeting me, and I'm sharing her digs, so I shall be fine. The train slid into the station, and the occupants of the carriage streamed out onto the platform. One of the men helped Lottie with her luggage, much to her dismay, but the moment he had put it on the platform, he lifted his hat and, to her great relief, left her. The motherly woman was still a little anxious. Sure I can't help you, love? I can easily wait a few minutes. Can you see your friend? Certain you'll be all right? Oh, please don't bother to wait, answered Lottie confidently. Stella is sure to be here. She promised she would be, and she's very reliable. But Stella was not there. She was nowhere to be seen. At first, Lottie waited quite happily. This was London, and she had never seen such crowds in her life. It was all very thrilling. Birmingham had seemed busy enough, but this was fantastic. People were hurrying about in all directions, thousands and thousands of them. The huge trains wound in or steamed out of the long platforms. Whistles blew, guards shouted, an occasional dog barked. People met each other and kissed, left each other and cried, waved shouted, ran, strode purposefully. Mountains of luggage piled on trolleys or wheeled towards the barrier. It was all wonderful, and Lottie was in high spirits. But there was still no sign of Stella, and now the big platform was almost empty. Slightly worried, she picked up her two small suitcases and made her way to the barrier. Stella is sure to be waiting over there, she chided herself. What a silly I am. What's the sense of buying a platform ticket when she only had to meet me and then go straight out again? Only two other people, both men, were still on the platform with her. Even the porters had gone. But the ticket collector was still at the barrier. Lottie trotted towards him. The ticket collector held his hand out for a ticket. Actually, I'm waiting for someone, said Lottie. So I'd rather stay on the platform, do you mind? I just want to look past you to see if my friend is waiting for me, that's all, okay? That's all right, my dear. Take a look around. Why not? I'll trust you. 
He chuckled in a fatherly manner. Lottie peered through the barrier. Stella was nowhere in sight. She confided in the ticket collector again. I've never been to London before, she said. I expect my friend has been held up. What would you advise me to do? Do you know her address? Yes. Well, I should wait another few minutes, then if she still doesn't come, take a cab to where your friend lives. Good idea, said Lottie gratefully. Thank you. She returned to the platform and sat on a bench with her two suitcases beside her. One of the men came and sat down beside her. He was a villainous-looking man of about 30, with a swarthy complexion, a mane of black hair, a large nose, and a loose-lipped red mouth. He was powerfully built and had huge square hands with swollen veins. Lottie studiously avoided looking at him, but he seemed determined to make her acquaintance. You're a stranger to London? he asked. She didn't reply. You live here? he insisted. Lottie moved further away from him. You were expecting someone, weren't you? he said. I've been watching you. You looked up and down the platform, then you talked to the ticket collector, and now you're waiting. Where do you want to go? Lottie kept silent. The man sounded impatient. Look here, he said. There's no need to be so standoffish. I know London. I can take you anywhere you want to go. Tell you what, I'll give you something to eat as well. No, thank you, said Lottie. Oh, come on, urged the man. What's the sense? I'm doing you a good turn. Lottie got up and moved away. The man followed her. Look, said Lottie, you go on pestering me and I'll ask the ticket collector to get rid of you. At that moment, the second man came alongside them. He lifted his hat. Forgive me if I'm intruding, he said in a pleasant, rather light voice, but I wondered if I could be of any assistance. Lottie looked at him. He was tall and thin, with fair straight hair, blue eyes, and a scrubbed, rather pink and white complexion. He was quietly, though well dressed, and he had a very pleasant smile. She warmed to him at once. Yes, you can help, thanks, she said gratefully. This man keeps on pestering me and he won't go away. I'm waiting for a friend who promised to meet me and this man has been watching me and wants to get fresh. Allow me to take the place of your friend for a few minutes, said the pleasant man. He then turned to the other man and said, perhaps you'd be good enough to leave the lady alone. I'm quite willing to take care of her. The big man started to protest, but finally shrugged his shoulders and departed. And Lottie's new friend smiled at her with great charm. Now, he said cheerfully, anything else I can do? Lottie gave him her name and told him all her troubles. So I'm a bit lost, she said anxiously. I don't know whether to stay here or go to her place. Come with me, Miss Blake, said the pleasant man. I'll take you to your destination. My name is Clandon, by the way. Peter Clandon. He took her by the arm. They passed the ticket collector and once outside the platform, he suggested refreshments in the refreshment room. And we can look out of the window and watch for your friend, he comforted her. Over their scrambled eggs and coffee, they became very friendly. And by the time they'd finished eating, darkness had already fallen. It was a fine night, and Lottie was delighted with the way things had turned out. She was even glad that there was no sign of Stella. This is quite an adventure, she told Peter, and he seemed pleased. He now suggested that he could show her around London a little before taking her to her digs, and she readily agreed. He took her by bus up Oxford Street and down Regent Street, and she chatted to him excitedly all the way. He was vastly amused by the fact that she had thought the man from whom he had rescued her was the killer of Paddington, and told her that it was his theory that killers seldom looked like killers, or they wouldn't get any victims. They both laughed heartily at this. Well, at any rate, I can see you're not one, she said. My friend told me never to talk to strangers, which is why I was clumming up on the other fellow, but you're quite different. You don't look like a stranger. And they both laughed again. Finally, she said she really must go to her friend's digs in case Stella was worrying about her, and Peter agreed. First come back to my place, he said. I've got a job to do and some gear to collect there. Then I'll take you on to your final resting place. What a horrid expression, laughed Lottie and Peter once again joined in the laughter. Peter lived 
in a surprisingly squalid part of Paddington. His room, which was on the third floor of a near derelict house, overlooked a nearly deserted lane leading to a disused warehouse. Lottie didn't like to show her surprise and dismay, but she felt a distinct lowering of her spirits as she looked about her. An iron bedstead with a filthy brick-red cover over what, judging from the bumps, appeared to be an exceedingly ill-made bed, was in the corner. Beside it was a chipped wash basin. A tall, fumed oak wardrobe with a vaguely Art Nouveau acorn motif was beside this, and in the centre of the room was a fumed oak circular gate-leg table and two bentwood chairs. The floor was covered in very old stained linoleum, on top of which was a threadbare rug in black and dirty mauve. On the wall opposite the cupboard was an unframed strip of mirror with a crack running across the top right-hand corner, and on the other side of the window was a built-in cupboard. The window, which had green hessian curtains of different lengths and a tattered frill on the top, was shut, and there was a sickly, rather sweet smell in the room, which reminded Lottie of something she was unable to place. "'Sit down, my dear,' said Peter cheerfully, "'and we'll have a glass of milk.' Gingerly, Lottie sat on one of the two dilapidated wooden chairs. Peter rummaged in the built-in cupboard and first of all produced two glasses and a bottle of milk, which he set on the table by Lottie with a joking, you pour out and be mother. Then from the lower part of the cupboard, he took out a hacksaw, some twine, a linen triangle, which reminded Lottie of a Boy Scout scarf, an old-fashioned razor, a hammer, and some nails. These he also put carefully on the table, having first spread out a clean but torn pillowcase as a tablecloth. He then went to the wardrobe and dressed himself in a white plastic boiler suit, which he zipped up to his neck over his suit. The boiler suit was fitted with a pixie hood, also in white plastic. Good heavens, laughed Lottie nervously. Whatever sort of a job are you going to do? My favourite kind, said Peter. The job I like doing best in the world. He sounded excited. What's that? asked Lottie. Peter smiled. Don't ask questions, and you won't be told lies, he replied. He smiled gaily. Lottie drank her milk hurriedly. She found that she was suddenly frightened, and she had no idea why. Perhaps it was the sight of Peter in his plastic overalls. He certainly looked rather sinister. Perhaps it was only this unlikely and hideous room, which, even by Lottie's standards, was depressing beyond belief. Perhaps it was the way Peter was now looking at her with what she could only describe to herself as a calculating intensity. She finished the milk quickly and set down the empty glass. Well, she said with an effort to sound gay and unconcerned, we'd better be off, haven't we? Stella will be mad at me. She stood up. Peter got up too, crossed swiftly to the door and locked it. What are you doing? Asked Lottie in amazement. Locking the door, said Peter flatly. I know, said Lottie, but why? Because you should never talk to strangers, he answered. Before she could reply, he gagged her with the triangle of linen, and in spite of her frantic struggles, he dragged her over to the iron bedstead. I'll have you first, he said, and then I'll kill you, like all the others, and I'll tell you how I always do it. I saw off your arms and legs while you're still alive, And though you're in agony, you don't die until I saw through your heart. I've always killed them like that. It's the way they struggle most, and it gives me a real kick. He laughed so hard that the tears came into his eyes. She fought with all her strength, but she was no match for him. And as she fought with him on the bed, she realised what the smell was that had been puzzling her since she came into the room. It was the smell of blood. The last thing she heard him say when he had cut off both her arms and was preparing to saw off her legs and just before she lost consciousness completely was never talk to strangers. Never talk to strangers. And there was exultation and hatred in his voice.